and you can't possibly be Muslims. I don't know how you've procured those clothes, but you're certainly not Muslims. Well, obviously, this awakened the hearts of some people, and there was violence towards the Crusaders because it woke them up from some people who were sleeping. And the Khalifa, although awake, was ineffectual. And that's why when you look at the historical sources, you don't read about him coming out of his lair from Baghdad. He doesn't come out. To come out and do what? With what? Their mothers or their, their wives are all Turkish from the tribe of the Seljuq. Their military commanders are Turkish. When they get sick of them, they physically remove them, put someone else in. And then since the ulama have come in, that stopped. But still, the Turkish tr shock troops that they have at any one time, if it wasn't for them listening to the ulama, they could, they could cut their necks. So what power does al-Mustadi and then his successors like al-Nasr, al what, what power do they have? None. None. Now, Salah al suffered a great loss when his brother Taj al-Muluk Majduddin died in 579 A.H. Just before that time, in 577 A.H., Ismail ibn Nuruddin died. And in 578 A.H., in which Salah al-Din conquered Harran, Saruj, Sinjar, Nasibin, and al he was just about to absorb al-Musul when a messenger from the Khalifa came and told him to desist, which he did. So he was just about to absorb Musul, which was in Iraq. And the Khalifa comes and says, don't absorb Musul. He sends a messenger, don't absorb Musul. Why? If Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi absorbs Musul, then he absorbs the Khalifa. Now the Khalifa is already a subservient to him. He's already been humiliated on the battlefield when Homs was taken. But if he absorbs al-Musul, it's a greater disrespect and you face the Shia that are in Baghdad and around that area may rise up against him. Because they'll see he's so weak he can't even stop people from absorbing the areas that are supposed to be within his territories. And so he's concerned about that. And so he says, don't take it. And out of respect, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi says, I won't take it. I won't take it. He said famously at one point after that, he said to his troops as he was with them, he said, do not fear the Arabs. They are like cats that have crawled up a pole and they'll never come down from it. <laughs> if you doubt the words that I say, and I'm an Arab saying this, if you doubt the words that I say, look at the Arab world today. Who's, who's really standing? Are, are the Chechens Arabs? Are the Afghanis Arabs? Are the Kashmiris Arabs? Who's the one that revived this deen? It's certainly not the Arabs. The Arabs only have the ulama and the Mahdi to come from them. Don't follow them in these matters. So from this time, the Arabs as a formidable world power are dead. Unless you are Asian, Uzbek or Turk, you don't run anything. And that's how it is. Now, Salah al-Din, further to that point, there was a time of unity when Salah al-Din asked for help in the form of nefta from the Khalifa. This was used by the Sultan Salah al-Din as a flamethrower that scorched the faces and bodies of crusaders and made them retreat. Here's how nefta worked. It was almost like napalm in some senses. What they would do is they would take this volatile material and they would pour it into containers and they would take a dry rag or dry piece of clothing, light it, put it on their, <coughs> excuse me, put it on their catapults and catapult them. When they hit the other side, they would break open and they would spread the fire all over the ground. The Molotov cocktail was born. <coughs> they also would have large devices to fire out this nephtha. <coughs> and they would be holding or have someone with, a, with either a stand or a stoop 
with a fire under the nephtha. So as the nephtha was shooting out in a straight stream, it was, it was catching on fire. And obviously you've got a line in front of, a line of crusaders in front of you who march in a phalanx straight fashion, so the whole front row's on fire. And it worked because no one likes to be on fire. <laughs> no human being wants to be on fire. And so people retreated. And the crusaders retreated. And it was one of the times that people could see that there was sort of a unity between Salah al-Din and the Khalifa. Now, there's one thing further I want to mention. Nephtha was also used <coughs> as a device for pouring over the crusaders. So when they would be trying to storm from their castle one of the fortresses of the Muslims, they'd pour it over the top and it had a sweet smell. And so they thought nothing of it, that it was either water or rose water. They didn't know what it was. And then one of the Muslims would throw a torch over the wall and they burned to death. And this is what happened in the battle. And so the Muslims began to turn the tide in the Middle East against the Crusaders. They began to turn the tide. Astrologers and soothsayers in 582 AH gathered together and predicted in the month of Sha'ban that the end of the world would occur as six of the planets were going to be in complete alignment. This terrified the unbelievers in general, and in particular the people of Byzantium who put much hope in such predictions. Many people from the unbelievers sold their possessions and property and waited in far away areas and watched the sky, waiting. Imam Ibn al-Imad and others noted this day and only shook their heads as the time passed for the prediction of the end of the world and newly wealthy landowners refused to give back the possessions sold to them by poor and extremely gullible people. So this type of understanding among unbelievers should not be unknown to us. And some of us get caught up in the hype. It had been said by some people among the unbelievers, 1914 is the end of the world. 1917, 1918, 1919, 1929, 1933-1939, 1949-1947 people at my door telling me the world is finishing in 1987 because the stock market crash 1994 1997 and Y2K in 2000 the predicted belief of some Christians that on the 31st of December 1999, 11.59 and 59 seconds, Jesus Christ would appear. Of all places, New York first. Because obviously, he has to come to the United States first, doesn't he? Even though he's coming from Jerusalem and Damascus, he's got to come there, doesn't he? Because that's where God is, isn't he? So this is the understanding that they had predicting the end of the world. Now what are they saying? They're saying 2012 now, aren't they? They're saying 2012, aren't they? They've made a movie about it the Mayan calendar, don't be deceived. They're always going, there are always going to be people that are prognosticators and astrologers that will say the planets are aligning and it must mean that because all the planets are lined up together that this is the end of everything, there's going to be tidal waves and everything else. No, what it means is the planets are aligned and it's a nice pattern and to glorify Allah's pattern with that. That's what it means. It doesn't mean anything else besides that. But the Muslims who, and I need to mention this, who had observatories as early as 900 AD, Muslims knew that this was cyclical. It's a pattern that happens. And so they already knew, of course, that they're aligned. But no one is sitting there thinking that the end of the world's going to come off the basis of that. Just like when unbelievers saw, oh, wait a minute, there's been so many eclipses within this period of time. Or the moon is going to be, there's going to be two full moons within this period. That must mean the end of the world is coming. Muslims didn't have this understanding. And that's why the historian Ibn al-Imad, it's mentioned that he just shook his head. Because he just felt rueful about this. And still today, there are people that believe it. There are people that, based upon the movie Independence Day, really hold the events in that movie to be true. People have seen 2012. Yeah, that's it. It's getting down to business. And the date that they even mentioned in the movie, uh-oh, it's coming. And in 2012, there's going to be that planetary alignment again. People were telling you 
And you know they were. Not as bad in the U.S. as here, but people were telling you, get rid of your electronics, stock up on food, because anything with microchips in it, because the computer can't recognize the zero zero, so it's going to go haywire. People were thinking uh, that computers were going to turn against man like Skynet and that automobiles were going to come to life and start running over their owners and uh, laptops were going to rebel and all these other things were going to happen. Toasters would start popping toast or cooking toast by themselves, and burning the hands of the people. People were coming with these wild ideas. Planes are going to go crazy. We're gonna... So they tried to ground all the airplanes on that day. We're not doing any charter flights. Because it may be during the Y2K situation, planes will just start falling out of the sky. People were really concerned. It's going to cost over a billion pounds to reconfigure all of our computers because Y2K is such a pressing issue. Every time these unbelievers are stricken with something that affects them monetarily, they interpret it to mean that it must be the end of the world. But little do they know that the end of the world will come when they least expect it. The day of resurrection is on a Friday. What goes on on Friday? Well, they're lathering up for their first bath they've had of the week or what have you. They're preparing for the party. They're preparing for everything else. They're getting ready to go drink. If you look at them on Friday, they're in their Friday best like we're in our Friday best. And it will come all of a sudden. Some of them will be in the tavern or the bar. Some of them will be doing nefarious activities. Some of them will be in the shower for that week that they're having. Some of them will be eating. Some of them will be drinking. They'll be caught all of a sudden. As the Prophet ﷺ said, some of them will be stumbling like drunkards and they're not drunk. Meaning the devastation, the cataclysmic effect of that day will be such that it will catch them without them even knowing what's going to happen. It's not going to be something you, you can predict and wait for. You can prognosticate and say, okay, I better get myself on track now and be the best I can be. No, it's going to be something that catches you. And that's why it's important that we recognize that these are trends that shaitan uses to trick the kufar. Mm. Muslims rejoiced in 583 AH when Salah ad-Din swept into Sham with his three generals, Muwafiq ad-Din, Imad ad-Din, and Abu Umar, all the sons of the great imam and preacher Ahmed ibn Qudama, and ousted the crusaders from Jerusalem and the immediate area after more than 90 years of occupation. The people celebrated greatly, and he began the task of turning Templum Domini back into the Dome of the Rock and the Palace of Baldwin I back into Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. More than 90,000 crusaders were defeated by merely 40,000 troops that did not have the numbers the unbelievers possessed. Okay, so when you look at that victory, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, he's walking around his camp at night. He's awake. Muwafiq <clears throat> al-Din al is awake. Imad al-Din is awake. Abu Omar is awake. And he sees some of his troops sleeping and not praying to Hajjud. He's kicking them. And he says, what are you sleeping for? This is the day before the battle. What are you sleeping for? And then one of the troops said something, and some of the other ones chuckled. And he says, what are you smiling for? And he said, yes, we've noticed, Salah Hadin, that you don't have much to smile about. He says, look around you. What is there to smile about? Look around you. So he was determined. He was focused. He was solemn. Not frowning, but just solemn. And so he went about his work very seriously. And one of the most beautiful things mentioned in the history books is when they came back into Jerusalem, they walked up the steps and they turned around, all of them, Imam Muwafiq al-Din, Imad al-Din, Abu Umar and Salah al-Din, the four generals, looking down across the steps the whole way that they'd marched into the whole city. And they made it. Imam Muwafiq al-Din did not remember the city of his childhood. Neither did his brother Abu Omar, neither did Imad al-Din. And their father did not live to see them come back and bring Jerusalem back to the Muslims. But alhamdulillah, they lived to see it in their lifetime. In this same city, Jews were allowed to come back into Jerusalem after having been ran out. The original Christians who were Orthodox were allowed to come back in. And the mass for 
Arab Christians was again said in Aramaic.